we welcome everyone to the annual meeting of the Brookline League of Women Voters. And we begin with a speaker, with a program with speakers and subsequently we'll hold our annual business meeting. So what I want you to know is that in the um, Zoom window, you should see at the bottom of the screen something that says chat, C-H-A-T. And if you have questions or you wanna make comments, the place to do it is in the chat and we will monitor that. And then at a moment when we have a period when we can have some feedback, we'll try to let folks uh, comment. Okay, <clears throat> so if all are on board, um, I want to first say welcome and thank you to the Assistant Town Clerk, Linda Goldberg, uh, with respect and affection. The League of Women Voters of Brookline will be honoring Linda, who is retiring after 27 years or more as the town's Assistant Town Clerk. She's been an outstanding partner with Brookline League members who provide regular voter registration opportunities around town and particularly at Brookline High School. She's provided us with ample supplies of voter registration forms. She's made sure that volunteers are properly trained and I think has rescued more than one little confusion that has occurred over this period. She's also regularly recruited, trained and supported poll workers and work to make our elections safe and accessible. And we very much appreciate that and have, I will say in the current year, probably become much more appreciative than we might've been before because we didn't understand how threatened the access to polling and fair and safe and honestly, honestly conducted elections could be so traumatic for people. So thank you for that in particular. Um, I also just want to let you know that she's been the in-house liaison for our annual voters guide, which is our big printed uh, document that we do for each municipal election that tries to give every candidate in a, for town meeting and townwide opportunities to state their positions uh, in order for all the voter, as many voters as we can reach to understand who they are and help them make their decision. And our, our editor, Joel Schoner, who's edited the Voter's Guide for more than a dozen years, has this comment, and I'm quoting, I could not have done it without the help of the town clerk's office. As the deadlines approached, my go-to person in the town clerk's office has always been Linda, and she has always, always come through. So I have definitely mixed feelings about her retirement. I consider her a friend and want to thank her for her help for all the years with the voter's guide. That one is heartfelt. And I want you to know, Linda, she, he's not the only person who has those thoughts, but Joel at least was able to express them so I can quote them for you. Um, I also want folks to know that we have received contributions to our Sarah K. Wallace Fund. It's our tax exempt fund in honor of Linda from folks who have many been uh, longtime poll workers and who faithfully take on this task at every election and in particular are personal witnesses to her ongoing support. And sort of as an aside, Linda grew up with and she went to school in Brookline with the daughters of Sarah K. Wallace. She knew Sarah who was from our perspective, a great pillar of the Brookline League and who who gave a major gift to endow the Sarah K. Wallace Fund. So that's a relationship that we cherish. And I would also say that Linda's professional strengths have provided continuity and stability, particularly during the recent period when our former town clerk, Pat Ward has been ill for years. And now she is actively supporting our recently elected new town clerk, Ben Kaufman, whom we welcome into the office and hope he can manage when Linda retires, mm -hmm. which he may have to call on her from time to time. And in recognition of Linda's contribution to our mission of voter education, we are very pleased and would, will subsequently, but not in person at this moment, <laughs> present her with a certificate, which is a, a, something that you may or may not wish to keep 
um, but it will, it will be something that's a permanent recognition, at least a document. And we're also providing an honorary one-year membership in the League of Women Voters, mm -hmm. which for the record will also include membership at the local and the state and the national league, uh, national level of the League of Women Voters. So we very much wish our, your very best um, conditions and we hope that you will enjoy this very well earned retirement. Thank you, thank you so much, Linda. We really appreciate it. And if you have a few words, you're allowed to speak. Thank you. Um, I do have a few words. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for this wonderful honor. I'm proud and very humbled to be recognized by you because um, I admire the League of Women Voters and the work you do, and I always have. Um, from the time I was probably a young married. Um, to be honored by this group is a wonderful way for us all to celebrate our work together at this particular milestone in my life. When I became the assistant town clerk 27 years ago, I was given the opportunity to drive change and develop new protocols. High on the list were revising election procedures, updating election materials, and expanding our pool of poll workers. From day one, the League has been a wonderful partner in raising the awareness of elections, the importance of participation, and the significance of actually voting. One of the many things that makes Brookline such a special place to live in and work in is our mutual commitment to civic engagement. I've always felt a sense of satisfaction um, in the activism and interest before and during elections, in the passionate participation in town meeting, and in the ever-growing number of volunteer boards and commissions. Of course, none of this works well unless citizens are as informed as they are engaged. So your work is vital for our citizens seeking information about candidates and issues, your Friday conversations, and the Warren article forums. They are all important venues for civil discourse and debate. The um, Voter's Guide in particular, which you produce every year um, for the annual town election is a critical, critical, critical tool for voters. Among your many successful projects, and to me, one of your most significant involves your reaching out to pre-register and to register 18-year-olds and to educate them about their rights and their responsibilities as voters. That is one of my pet projects. Um, although I am extremely proud to have you on me, I'm more proud of my association with you and the relationship that we have developed over the past 27 years. Thank you so much for all that you do and for this wonderful honor. I, I'm deeply, deeply appreciative of this. And Linda, we are very much appreciative of all of the time you have given both to the league, but also to the residents of the town of Brookline. And we know that you have left a very important history behind you, which will be important for folks to follow in your footsteps to be able to meet the same standards. We have high standards here. You helped to set them and we expect that they will continue. So we very much appreciate it. And now I hope you can see on the screen the thing that we will be giving you in person, yes. <laughs> um, which is a certificate of appreciation. Um, and you will hear from our yeah. membership chair, Sheila Hussey, about your full-time membership officially. So you'll get those things independently. Um, we do have a plan for you to have an actual physical certificate, not just the one that's on the screen. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Dealing with these different and unusual, well, let me put it this way, with these times where we're being, we're doing things slightly differently, but we're trying to do everything that we would have wanted to do under any circumstances. So thank you so much, Linda, and best of luck in your 
let's call it new life, maybe. And new adventures. <laughs> new adventures. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you all again. I really appreciate this. And I was totally surprised by it. Well, you shouldn't be given <laughs> long term that we've spent together. Thank you. And make a little noise. <laughs> and now, because in part, in part of, of Linda's comment about working with Brookline High School students, I want to welcome Rusty Browder, who is the chair of our Sarah K. Wallace trustees, um, who will announce the recipients. E each year we have an annual award to a high school student who has um, achieved certain levels in, in what are the values cherished by the League of Women Voters. The, um, we, we receive a recommendation from uh, folks who work with the kids in the school. And so this year we actually have two recipients and I will now give Rusty the opportunity to tell us who they are and how they became so honored. So Ms. Browder, you have the floor. Or Thanks, the Rusty. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you, Linda. You have um, named some of the activities, most of the activities that the Sarah K. Wallace Fund for Voter Education supports of the league, the voter's guide, the public events, the warrant and candidate forums and so forth. It's, it's um, a wonderful fund that is supported by a lot of you who are attending the meeting. And I thank the Sarah K. Wallace donors past, present and future uh, for your generosity. Um, civic education at all levels is an important part of the league's mission and including young people um, is, is, a, is a, a really key part of that effort. Um, our league, as mentioned before, connects with Brookline High School uh, students and staff to register new 18 year old voters. And uh, also Sarah K. Wallace Fund presents senior awards for leadership. And this year, as Betsy mentioned, we have two awardees who have demonstrated civic involvement during their high school years in the fine tradition of Sarah K. Wallace. Uh, one of our senior award winners uh, can't be with us today, Samantha Brady Meyeroff. Her outstanding work began when COVID came upon us. She recognized that the organization Mutual Aid Brookline would be key in providing services to residents. She volunteered on its hotline and given her incredible resourcefulness and skill, she was soon in charge of coordinating over 50 volunteers working throughout the pandemic to provide a huge range of help to families and individuals. Our other awardee this year, Catherine O'Connor, has provided significant leadership in issues of social justice, advocating for the LGBTQ community, in particular, the transgender community, serving as site coordinator for Get Out the Vote efforts, designing and presenting day of perspective programs at Baker School addressing race and racism. And she held state and national level internships with Elizabeth Warren at the National Center for Transgender Equality in Washington, DC and with the Massachusetts Commission for LGBTQ plus youth. Catherine is with us today by video to share what her plans are as she moves on to college. And Ernie will launch the video. Hi everyone, thank you for allowing me to virtually attend this meeting. Um, again, I'm so grateful to have been a recipient of the Sarah K. Wallace Award alongside my friend, Sam. Um, so as Rusty can tell you, uh, it's been a little bit hard to reach me in the week since graduation in early June, um, since I actually went on a long remote camping trip um, to Acadia National Park with my sister right after the ceremony. Um, and that trip really gave me some time to reflect on um, exactly what this update is about though. Um, so as a senior at BHS during a pandemic, I've had a little bit of a rough year um, as, all or many of us have had, but it, it really made me realize the importance of being a conduit for change um, and a resource for those who are younger than me, namely um, BHS uh, sophomores and juniors. Um, and so being a resource in my community has become a really important thing to me. Um, 
So right now, post-graduation, I'm really looking forward to the summer and going into college at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, and on the flip side of what I just mentioned, I'm actually like really looking forward to coming in as a freshman and having to rebuild that community um, that I found in Brookline. Something that's also been on my mind, um, sort of more unfortunately, has been the surge of anti-transgender athlete bills um, across straight legislatures across the country, um, and specifically how the queer and feminist movements have been pitted against each other, namely through groups that are usually anti-feminist, um, and just pitted against each other in a way that feels false and just doesn't really make sense to me. And uh, this matters to me a lot as a non-binary athlete trying to continue my sport on the Northwestern fencing team. Um, so to be more specific, um, I'm really interested in how it's just going to play out with um, messaging strategy, political messaging strategy, when it comes to defeating these anti-transgender athlete bills. Um, so I'm potentially excited about some social science research um, at Northwestern about that, but anyway, things are up in the air. Um, I've never been on campus, I guess not not in real times, so um, I'm really excited about that, but also just leaving a lot of room for growth and opportunity and just not knowing what's next um, as I approach this like new chapter, and new semester in my life, so. Anyway, that's my quick update. Sorry, I'm so over time, but wishing you all the best. I think you can tell easily how much energy um, the graduating generation and younger generations are bringing to civic engagement and social justice. And we're very lucky to have people like Samantha and Catherine working to bridge uh, the divides that exist and to work for our common good. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, and also, I'm delighted, I just want to mention that I'm delighted that Molly Turlish, whom you will meet, will join the Sarah K. Wallace team as it moves ahead in the coming year. Um, again, thank you, everybody who supports the Sarah K. Wallace Fund for Voter Education. It's a wonderful, wonderful support to the league. And I would just like to add that it is always reassuring and in some ways encouraging and even empowering to hear about the students who receive these awards and the kind of leadership they will be providing going forward. It helps for us in the older generation to think, okay, there will be a succession out there. We may not be around to see it, but that's all right. Things will continue and we will have the same quality of uh, enlightened and thoughtful um, leadership coming forward. It's a very reassuring thing, I will have to say. And it's also, in a funny way, more so now with the COVID pandemic, because everybody's been so isolated. Uh, I'm sorry that Sam, Samantha brady Meyerhoff could not join us, um, but she has all of the same qualities that you just heard. So um, we are delighted, pleased, and in a funny way, sad that they weren't able to both be here, but we do understand, and we wish them the best of luck going forward. Um, and now I'm going to shift to uh, a totally different set of, uh, let's call it, voter issues. Um, I'm welcoming our Massachusetts representative, Tommy Vitolo, who represents the 15th Norfolk District, which happens to include 11 of the Brookline 16 precincts. So he is our major state rep. Um, and we've asked him to give us some updates on the legislature act activities. And in particular, um, there are carry forward things having to do with the pandemic, uh, some exceptions that have been made, extending deadlines for various things. Um, and we have uh, some special, there were conditions having to do with early voting and what is and is not permitted, and then what can or cannot continue in remote meetings um, because we're all, I think at the league and as well as many others, particularly um, want to make sure that open meeting laws are um, continue to be in effect. But we also acknowledge that there may need to be some accommodations for an open meeting in the very circumstances that we are holding one right now, which is to say you're not in the room together. Um, and I know that's a technical pr problem, but it also has a legislative impact. 
Um, and then there are some other things that uh, had to do with COVID. I don't know what our rep knows now about the funding that is slowly sifting through, but it would be nice to hear anything by way of an update. And finally, uh, something that is of significance locally, as well as at the state and national level, and that is the census data, which is only going to become available in September, which normally would have been available in March, uh, in order for us to meet the requirements for redistricting. In Brookline, we would be redistricting our 16 precincts. Uh, at the state level, they would be redistricting for state reps and state senators. And then at the national level, redistricting for state representatives. So there's a huge amount of redistricting overlap, uh, all of which is significantly affected by the late arrival of census data, which is a requirement um, in order for any of this to be done going forward. So Tommy, have I left anything out? <laughs> um, maybe a bit here or there. Uh, we'll find out. And certainly, um, I'm going to hope to leave a minute or two at, at a minimum for questions. Um, sure. But we, as we would, be, we would be very pleased to offer questions. Don't worry about it. As Betsy, Betsy mentioned, I am State Representative Tommy Vitolo. I am at the State House uh, working today, and I am at the State House almost every day at this point. Um, I find it is, in fact, more productive to do it in person. Um, and I want to talk about a couple of different things that have happened, uh, starting with the um, assignment that I received to be the Vice Chair of Election Laws on the House side. And so I spend quite a bit of time uh, reading testimony, talking with uh, advocates, with town clerks and with others about election laws and potential changes to election laws uh, and working through legislation. And to that end, I wanna begin um, with the leadership of Chair Dan Ryan, who filed Amendment 28 last week, which the House passed and sent over to the Senate. And that bit off a significant chunk of the Votes Act and just went ahead and popped it into law during a supplementary budget debate because, well, there's no bad time to pass good election laws. And, uh, and so what we did in the House, again, it's not the law yet, we're waiting on the Senate, um, is require the Secretary of State to mail applications for mail-in ballots to, to all registered voters for each election. Um, for presidential elections, the ballots uh, have to be postmarked on election day and received within three days afterward. Um, for other elections, they have to be received uh, by the close of polls. And that's uh, frankly in order to make sure that the primary results are processed quickly enough for the general. Uh, and the bill establishes uh, required windows for in-person early voting, including mandatory weekend hours for all elections. And I'm gonna say it again, the House passed it, the Senate has not taken it up yet. It is um, not clear what they are going to and when they are going to do it. So that the House did it doesn't make it a guarantee. Uh, these are portions of the Votes Act, not the whole thing. The, elect the Joint Committee on Election Laws has had a hearing on the Votes Act. We have heard um, from the petitioners, um, Representative John Lawn and sen our Senator, Senator Cynthia Cream, um, and we're still we're going to work through that. That that may take uh, upwards of the next year to continue working through that language. But some of it, as I said, the House has already passed. Um, the Senate passed an extension of COVID era voting regulations through December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. The House did not pass that in our extension because we had already passed this Amendment twenty eight. And so the House and Senate through conference are going to figure out what we can do now and what we will do later. My hope is that whatever permanent changes we make uh, to election laws, we do before um, the next election, right? Let's sort of have some continuity uh, and I will continue working with my colleagues to try to get that done. Um, Maybe on that, have you had any more to say about the Votes Act and election? Because this may be a pause for questions. Sure, happy to take questions. Uh, if, if, if it's okay. I mean, if you feel this, this is the right time. All right. Are there questions with regard to what you just heard, which is in uh, my understanding of it, 
a bit of a muddle. We aren't exactly sure what, if any, will be in effect uh, in the springtime and in Brookline, at least, our next uh, expectation for an election would be the municipal election normally scheduled in May. So questions for our state rep. If you want to speak, you got to uh, raise your hand physically, wave it at me and we'll, we'll recognize you. Um, there's also, yeah, you have to do that. And if I don't see any questions, we'll invite our- Rusty's got a question. Sorry? Yeah. Rusty's got a question. Rusty's question is, it's, it's not just Brookline, Tommy. Uh, Massachusetts has provided leadership in a number of ways, um, you know, in gun control and now with, with voting, you're doing good things. Is there any cross fertilization with state legislatures and other states that you might just mention or reflect on briefly? Yeah, uh, you know, the most of the advocacy organizations have both a state and a national footprint, much like the League of Women Voters, right? Who, who is sort of, there's the Massachusetts organization, but then there's, there's national organizations, similarly ACLU, has a Massachusetts chapter and a national organization. And so uh, the advocates are working the various state legislatures um, as effectively as they can across the country, contingent on right um, how amenable that particular legislature is to good election laws. The schedule, each state has a different legislative calendar. Um, so there's no question that these efforts are going on across the country. And in general, it's been my experience that um, state representatives and state senators from different states, um, you know, we talk to each other at conferences or we know each other through other ways. And so there's buzz that gets around, but there's really, there's actually a, a national organization, um, a, like a trade group of the state legislatures who keeps us all informed of what other states are up to. Um, and frankly, my constituents never fail to let me know when another state has done something worth doing. So for example, Maine just passed a law calling for the um, disinvestment of fossil on fossil fuels from the pension funds. And within 48 hours, I heard from a dozen constituents about how we ought to be doing what they're doing. Uh, so, so word gets around. Okay, uh, are there any other questions or comments? And this is really just at the moment. The, the topic is uh, voting as we go forward. And clearly some, um, I, we hope, uh, some issues to be resolved between the House and the Senate at the legislative level in order to determine how the spring elections will actually be conducted. So seeing no more hands up. Then... So I'll move on, but I do wanna mention that while it's true, uh, Betsy noted that for Brookline likely the next election is spring of 2022. Uh, cities very often have their elections in November on odd numbered years. So there are many cities, Boston, for example, but certainly not the only one who are having elections in September and November of 2021. So we actually have a, a tighter timeline thinking about what we want for the rest of 2021 and then what we want going forward. Uh, so there'll be plenty of work to do there. Think about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, it was originally filed by uh, leader Mike Moran as H820. It was renumbered H3863. Mike Moran, of course, represents Brighton and Precinct 1 of Brookline. Um, and it was a change in how redistricting happens. And it only applies for this 10-year uh, process because it's in response to the delayed census data. And the problem... Uh, there's two problems that uh, Leader Moran is trying to solve. The first is the one of timing. We have to, by constitutional mandate, get the U.S. Congress and state House and Senate districts drawn on time. And there's no exception made for COVID. They didn't think of that when they wrote the Constitution in 1780 uh, or in any of the amendments since then in the case of Massachusetts. And so... Uh, that provision does not exist for municipal elections. Municipal elections have more time than U.S. Congress, Mass House, and Mass Senate. And so um, it's important to get those ones done 
uh, in on time. And if it takes more time to do municipal, that's okay. Uh, and, and so that was one observation. The other observation is that minority majority districts are important um, for a variety of reasons, including it's the law. And the ability to draw as many minority majority districts as possible um, is an important value uh, that many of folks share, including myself. And so giving the legislature, the, the Joint Committee on Redistricting, the tools to do that was important. And in order to achieve both of these objectives, um, Bill H. 3863 said that rather than have the town draw the precincts, in case in this case, Brookline has 16, and then try to use those precincts to draw state house, state senate, and US house districts. Instead, the legislature at the state level would go first using block data. And that is literally the number of people who live on a piece of land that's surrounded by roads, right? A block. And so you can think about it, uh, you remember like Lego bricks, right? There's the little teeny tiny Legos, then there are the medium sized Legos. And then for small children, there are what are called Duplos, those bigger blocks. We well, can think of precincts as those big Duplo blocks and, and blocks as those little teeny tiny bricks. And by giving the state legislature the ability to use the little teeny tiny bricks, it can uh, one, not have to wait for the towns to build the big blocks, but also design districts that more precisely ensure uh, a larger number of minority majority districts. And so I'll use an example, I'm not arguing this is the example, uh, but it's one that I think people in Brookline can understand. Look at Precinct 16. So Precinct 16 has two very different types of housing. It has a large number of small single family homes, predominantly owner occupied by whites. And then it also has Hancock Village. Rental housing, a uh, much greater percentage of BIPOC population, right? And so if we start with Precinct 16 and try to create a minority majority district in the region, you would have to include both the single family homeowners and Hancock Village because the town drew the precinct that way. But if we start with US Congress, Mass House and Mass Senate districts, it's imaginable that including Hancock Village but not the rest of Precinct 16 could allow for a minority majority district that you otherwise couldn't get. And so if we value making sure that um, people who are black, indigenous or otherwise of color have opportunities to have majority minority districts, then this change uh, further allows that to happen. Now that's passed the House. It has not passed the Senate yet. I don't know if they will be taking it up this week or not. Um, frankly, it was filed by Leader Moran and Senator Brownsberger. They are the co-chairs of their redistricting committee. So I expect it will have some, some wind in its tails in the Senate as well. Uh, but I don't know uh, if it will pass and ultimately become law. Whatever we do, we need to do it quickly because as Betsy mentioned, uh, the census data becomes available both to the state and to the municipalities in September. And we have to finish the legislative districts at the state and federal level by December 15th, finish, right? And so uh, moving quickly uh, is important from a constitutional perspective. Happy to take questions on that. And I know Janice Khan has one. I'm gonna clarify, I have a clarification question sure. now give you uh, the audience. Um, this means that the state could make districts, and I'm gonna use as an example, our state representative districts that are different with boundaries that are different from precincts. In other words, what you just described meant- more Yeah, so more precisely, the town is going to redraw its precinct lines anyway. Right. But what it does mean is the town could draw precinct lines that are different from the new state legislative districts. That is possible. It turns out it's not that common. It does exist today. They're commonly called AB precincts, where voters come in, they vote at the same location, but they would get an A ballot if they're in one person's district, but a B ballot if they are in a different person's district. And that sounds really confusing, but that's exactly what the voters who vote at Runkle School do today. If you live, if you vote at Runkle School, you live in precinct 12 or 13, but most voters don't know what precinct number they in. They just know where they go vote. 
And when they go to Runkle School, they then get sorted into people who are getting all of this stuff, but the town meeting members from Precinct 12 ballot, or all of the same stuff, but the town meeting members from Precinct 13 ballot. So we have experience in this in Brookline today, not in the form of AB precincts, but in the form of two precincts voting at the same location, which to a voter feels exactly the same. Okay, we have a question from Janice Khan. Janice, uh, you can be unmuted if you aren't already, speak up. Okay, thanks very much, Betsy. And thank you to Tommy. Betsy actually asked one of the questions I'm still puzzling about, which is how, um, you know, what it will look like at the local level when the state does this first. But um, the Mass Municipal Association is opposing doing that. And, um, and you know, the idea is that people in local communities know more about what's happening in their community than people at the state house. Obviously, Tommy, you know more about Brookline and you pay attention to Brookline. But, you know, Hancock Village is a tricky example because it's not, it's not necessarily people of color who are living there. To, um, traditionally, it had been a lot of foreign students. A lot of them were Russian. I don't know how you classify Russians, but um, you know, they're, it's, it's tricky. And now that they're, they're renovating all of Hancock Village, the rents are going sky high. So it's, you know, it's unclear exactly what Hancock Village is even going to look like when the whole project is finished. I'm certainly not clear. And typically Precinct 16 has had the cheapest of all the single family homes in Brookline. So that was typically the most affordable housing in Brookline. I mean, that's why I ended up in almost into Newton is because this was the other very, you know, more affordable, remember everything is relative in Brookline, um, a more affordable part of town than closer to the city where land was more valuable. Um, so I, I, I still need to, I feel like I still need to learn more sure. about how, how the local and the state perspective really will interact in a way that makes sense for <laughs> us as a local municipality. So, so to be clear, uh, cost of housing is not a consideration for uh, drawing boundaries for minority majority district, but ethnicity and race are. And to be clear, the racial composition of the people who live in precinct, precinct 16, not Hancock Village, is notably whiter than the people who live in Hancock Village. And so I, I agree with what you're saying and that you know, there are layers to it and there are complexities, but I merely use it as an example to point out that when you draw a circle with 3,600 people in it, which is roughly what a Brookline precinct is, uh -huh. you could include two dividable subsets that have very different racial makeups. And if you're trying to draw minority majority districts, which in fact is required by law, uh, then that can be a barrier. And you're right, the MMA has opposed, but it's also true that common cause, mass vote, drawing democracy, and the ACLU are in favor because they recognize that while this might be a slight pain in the neck to the, the former Linda Goldbergs of the world who have to deal with the election laws aspect, the fact that it gives a clearer and stronger voice to populations who have historically been willfully excluded or minimized through elections is considered a more important outcome. And so how it affects Brookline is anyone's guess. My guess is that um, after the, the state is done, should this become law, Brookline will say, oh, we can easily draw precincts that align with the state legislative and U.S. congressional boundaries. And this will have been a philosophical concern, but in practice, it won't be a concern at all. Uh, it'll, it'll be easily handled. That's my expectation. And I will tell you that uh, Leader Moran has been having conversations with every single House legislator to find out about concerns like, oh, Hancock Village is changing dramatically over the next year. So we want to think a little bit more carefully about what re-precincting, including Hancock Village, or what redistricting, including Hancock Village, will look like. And so I can't tell you he's going to be perfect or that every representative uh, has as much of a finger on the pulse as I try to. But I think in general, it's true. And I think in general, um, I think that the redistricting at the state level and federal level um, will go well. Ten years ago, 
Leader Moran was in charge of it. He wasn't Leader Moran at the time. Uh, and, and the state won national praise for our, the lines that were drawn 10 years ago. And the same person is drawing the lines or is in charge of the process of drawing the lines this time. The last thing I want to get to, and I, and I know we got to wrap up, is okay. uh, the extension of COVID measures, uh, which I know folks were really uh, interested about. Um, I, and I know that, you know, for Ernie Fry, it was the cocktails to go. But for the rest of us, we were really focused on open meeting law and representative town meeting. Ernie, I'm kidding. Um, as you know, the um, state of emergency ended on June 15th. And the governor gave us about four weeks notice that that was happening, right? About, at about May 15th, plus or minus a few days, he said June 15th is the end of the state of emergency. Uh, and so the legislature, the well, House and Senate had to, number one, figure out what we thought was important to continue post June 15th, <laughs> and then pass it, and then agree, and then repass it, and get the governor to sign it. Uh, and 30 days is a really tight timeline to do all of those things. So we took us 31. We, um, we got it signed. We, we passed it on June 16th. Um, excuse me, on June 15th. It expired 12.01 a.m. We passed it late in the evening on the 15th, and the governor signed it the next day. And the bill includes a variety of issues related to restaurants uh, and alcohol, related to um, access to certain medical um, diagnoses. Uh, but really what I think folks uh, are interested in this particular forum is how it relates to public meetings. And I wanna make really clear that representative town meeting is a very different kind of meeting by state law than the other kinds of meetings. So we're gonna talk about them separately. And I'll start by talking about representative town meeting because in some ways it's easier. Uh, we extended the ability for communities who use representative town meeting to have an all virtual meeting until December 15th, 2021. And I've been really clear with the moderator that we are gonna be done by December 15th and I will not lobby for an extension. We have plenty of time to schedule our fall town meeting to finish on time. And I have no doubt that we're capable of doing it. I don't know if Brookline will choose to be all in person or all virtual. <laughs> what I do know is that a hybrid is not a choice. The town can either have an all virtual representative town meeting uh, in November when we typically have one, or we can have an all in person. We cannot have a hybrid. And so that's the representative town meeting extension. Most communities who have representative town meeting met in person throughout COVID. Very few used virtual. And what they did is they met in the football field and they met outside with distancing and they figured out ways to work through while in person. Brookline was one of few communities who did it virtually, uh, which has its benefits and, and its deltas, as they say. With respect to uh, open meeting law, which is the law that governs all other municipal meetings, the legislature extended the COVID era regulations until April 1st, 2022. And the distinction between the COVID era open meeting law and the sort of the standard time open meeting law is actually really simple and really small. There are only three differences. The first is that under COVID, you do not need to have a quorum of committee members physically present to proceed with the meeting. Prior to COVID, the select board needed to have at least three people in the hearing room who are select board members in order to have that meeting. Now they can have zero or one or two or three or four or five up until April 1st, 2022. The second rule is that the person who is running the meeting, whether it's the chair or the, uh, somebody who the chair assigns, need not be physically present. And that again is until April 1st, 2022. So you can run a meeting virtually as Betsy is doing today under the COVID rules, but not pre-COVID and not after April 1st. The third requirement is that it used to be you had to allow the public to physically attend unless you were in executive session. Under COVID, you are, the community is not required to allow anyone from the public to physically attend. Those are the only three differences. And so to be clear, Nothing 
ever prevented a city or town from allowing the public to watch or to testify virtually. The town was legally allowed to do it before COVID, legally allowed to do it now, legally allowed to do it in the future. The same applies to town staff. Town staff have always been legally allowed to attend virtually and including make comments. Finally, um, is there another difference? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, 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 so again, now um, the public isn't guaranteed the right to attend in person. The town can still do hybrid meetings or all in-person meetings between now and April 1st, 2022. Nothing requires the town to do all virtual. That is the town's choice. The state has not told the town that they have to or that they can't, merely that they are allowed to. It is my hope that the town transition to hybrid as quickly as it can, because currently attending all virtual excludes some members of the public who don't have sufficient bandwidth to use Zoom, who don't have the information technology equipment or comfort in using Zoom, who have some difference in ability that prevents them from using Zoom effectively, right? The public has a right to observe the meetings. And in my view, that means as soon as we can, the public needs to be allowed to attend physically. And that doesn't mean that all of the board members have to be physical, but at least one would. I think that's important. I know the town is working on it. Uh, it's gonna require some training and some IT to get there. Uh, and I hope that the town works very hard on getting there because I think we should all expect that to become required by law as of April 1st, 2022, that we are not, it is not likely in my view that we will allow all virtual local meetings because it excludes some members of the public unnecessarily. Happy to take questions on that. Okay, any questions coming from our audience? Uh, and I have to say, you're, you're gonna have to possibly make a noise in addition to raising your hand because I can't see everybody at once, but if you, <clears throat> to speak, you can wave a hand. Um, well, while we're looking, I see Clerk Kaufman gazing longingly at his former chair in the background over here. And he used to <laughs> sit right there, um, but he's moved on uh, and, and we, we'll, we'll struggle through without him, but well, I'm sure we we'll do okay. Ask our new town clerk if he is, um, let's just say how, how he feels about all these things that are coming directly uh, from his former <laughs> office <laughs> and how they will impact in Brookline. I don't know, Ben, do you have any thoughts you wanna make? And if so, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, sure, thank you, Betsy and hi, Representative. Nice to see you and, and good to see Emma fill in that chair well. Um, uh, I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, proposals coming out of the, uh, the state level that are gonna be able to increase participation and access in Brookline, which, uh, I think is always a good thing. So uh, it's definitely something at the front of the mind in the clerk's office uh, for myself and, and the staff here uh, to ensure we're able to accommodate any changes, any adjustments, uh, and any of the work that that might entail uh, that we're ready to take it on and, and ensure that it's a, a smooth process uh, implementing any of the changes that happen from the state level. So uh, uh, it's been great having Representative Vitolo keep me apprised of what's going on and, and for him to be a resource for me to uh, get questions answered and learn what's going on. And I look forward to implementing whatever it is the state may ask of us. Thank you. Um, Tommy, I have a follow-up, so to speak, a little bit of a technical question on the issue of redistricting. Um, and uh, sorry, I'll wait for on that. Janice, you've got your hand up, or is that the old hand up? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do have a hand up. Um, just on, on, well, first of all, I just wanna um, congratulate Ben and also acknowledge that he did a really terrific job at town meeting, um, making sure that the votes were out very efficiently and um, just wanted to note that with appreciation. Um, so thanks, Ben. Um, no, the question was that, Tommy, we've always been able to call in at meetings, you know, so it wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, we weren't filming meetings, but we, people, board members could phone in, for instance, and, and participate remotely. And I'm wondering, when you say hybrid, are you thinking that it has to be um, visual or 
Are you thinking that it could be phone in? N nothing in the state law uh, includes or excludes visual, right? And so Janice is right. Um, the hybrid meeting that we used to think of was one or more members of the board or committee call in on the telephone and use a, like a conference call line, and then they'd be able to vote and fully participate um, from afar. Uh, and, and that remains the case today, except that the number of members has gone from 49% to up to 100%. And uh, there's no longer an obligation to allow members of the public to attend in person. So, so nothing about pre-COVID, during COVID, or after COVID mandates video. Uh, certainly, you would need audio uh, for the meeting to proceed as, as we think of meetings. Sounds like we have more things to consider. And Tommy, I just have one, and it's sort of a technical question, follow up on census. What I remember as a part of the redistricting process 10 years ago um, was that we, we referred to census tracts. You're talking about land blocks. How does a census tract relate to a land block? So I thank you, Betsy. And I, uh, I will acknowledge I was on that committee with you 10 years ago. Yeah. And it was the work we were doing on that committee um, that I first met Ernie Fry, who was interested in that work and, and sent me a note or gave me a phone call. And I went over to his apartment over on Washington Street and we talked about redistricting. Um, so, so I worry I'm going to get the language not quite right because this is not my, uh, this is no longer on my committee, right? This is the redistricting committee. But my recollection is that um, blocks are the atoms of redistricting. You cannot subdivide the block. Right. Everybody who lives on that block must be in the same district for any for any level of government. Right? You can't cut it in half. Okay. And, Tracts, my, my memory, I could be wrong, but tracts was a collection of blocks, something akin to a neighborhood, not drawn in the same way we would draw our neighborhoods or the way that, say, the Brookline Neighborhood Alliance would draw the neighborhoods, but it was a collection of blocks that was sort of helpful to think of as a group. Um, and so, so when we redistrict uh, at the precinct level 10 years ago, we used blocks uh, we were given tract information, but we were actually given the block by block data. And that's what we used in drawing the line and in trying to find population balance uh, between the different precincts, you might end up with a funny squiggle because we needed one more block to make this precinct the right number and to make this other precinct the right number. And while a straight line might look nice, it didn't actually meet the standard of um, nearly equal population in the different precincts. And that's the same uh, standard and approach that is used for uh, Massachusetts House districts, Massachusetts Senate districts, and US House districts. So the block is that smallest um, sort of atomic level for re-precincting. Right. And, 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 and in September, everybody will know exactly how many people, according to the US Census, which is the only number that matters, not who's gonna live there next year, uh, but, but who's there for that census. How many people live in each and every one of those blocks? And I use the word people deliberately. It doesn't matter if you're a US citizen. It doesn't matter if you're old enough to vote. All people are counted for redistricting and they're all counted the same. Right. Um, and just for clarification, the question I was asking and wanted to clarify is the census uh, system creates a census tract and the, each tract is intended to have the same number of persons in it of all kinds. So census tract one, two, three, and four, each should contain the same number of persons. And what is part of the process is figuring out how to make those physical, physical areas match the various other needs we have to balance populations for districting. Anyway, sorry about that. Yeah, so I think the tracks are used for other statistical yes. purposes, right. but not really so relevant for redistricting. Yeah, anyway. All right, uh, having said that, thank you very much, Tommy. We have clearly much more to come. 
and we'll have to figure out how to get updates on these things as time passes. I know you do a regular uh, program that's broadcast on BIG, and I assume you will be uh, continuing to update in, uh, in that way. Is that right? That's right, and I'm always happy to come back uh, either on Zoom or in person uh, as, as the case. Well, we may, we may work something out down the road. Um, anyway, I think uh, it's now an opportunity to hear at least from the uh, local rep, um, yeah. or I should say our uh, local select board member, John Van Skoyak, who um, on his own has been very much interested in uh, local government operations and so to speak, how, how things function, how things function effectively and operate well. And we asked him to give us a comment on what the local impacts of some of these various things the legislature is doing um, might be. And so, John, we offer you the opportunity to respond or comment in whichever way you like. Thanks very much, Betsy. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and especially so because uh, Linda Goldberg was uh, honored earlier in the meeting and um, one of my favorite people for many years at town hall. Um, and um, I always hesitate to bring up things like this, but uh, I may be one of the few people in this meeting who actually goes back to the days of Sarah Wallace. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 you know, I can say uh, I knew Sarah Wallace uh, back then. Um, <laughs> somebody else did too. Good. I did uh, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. We're all here, <laughs> the Sarah Wallace fan club. Um, these thoughts are going to be a little bit random uh, because Tommy in the in the finest legislative uh, tradition um, <laughs> took more time than he was allotted on the schedule, but that's because you guys have lots of questions and that's fine. And I will try not to take more time than I'm allotted. Um, only, only because I know that we're all, you know, um, <laughs> we all have uh, things to do after this. And also because um, my, my laptop will run out of battery uh, power if I don't, if I don't restrain myself. Uh, at the select board, um, we did have a, an in-person meeting um, as a result of this um, deadline that lapsed, you know, for there to be some renewal legislation. And then there was a two-day period, two days or so, before the, um, leg the necessary legislation was adopted. So in that little two-day window, um, we, we had a, a, an in-person meeting um, in the select board hearing room at town hall and having been elected in june of 2020 uh june of 2020 one year ago it was my first meeting with my fellow select board members in person and so it was my first chance to um enjoy the luxury uh the, 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 i don't know if this is uh well known publicly but uh when the select board meet, let's say, uh, as we did last time um starting at four o'clock in the afternoon because of an executive session um, there is pizza to be devoured during the executive session so that we don't starve during the meeting. I'm not used to eating my dinner at four o'clock in the afternoon. I know I'm a retiree, but you know, I'm not a, a blue plate special retiree, but, um, so I, I have to get used to, uh, I guess I'm going to have to get used to sort of eating, um, early pizza dinners if we continue to meet virtually, I mean, excuse me, to meet, uh, in person, as it turns out, Having had that one meeting um, last Tuesday, we're, we're going right back to uh, virtual meetings because uh, the, the legislature did uh, pass legislation, which does enable us to continue uh, the virtual meetings. And we frankly don't have the technology in place for there to be um, a so-called hybrid meeting where we are in the meeting room at town hall and some of the public is participating from the meeting room at town hall. And then others of the public are calling in or, uh, you know, or you know, participating by Zoom. So until we have that capability, I think you're going to continue to see the select board and other boards, commissions, committees of Brookline Town Government uh, meet virtually. And I would argue, and, and, and I, I, I pray that Tommy's still here, and, and if not, I'll, I'll get this message to him later. Um, <clears throat> I would, I would ask the legislature to seriously, seriously consider that there just might be more advantages to the public 
to allowing even the select board and the school committee to continue to have their meetings uh, virtually. Um, for certain, there is an advantage, <clears throat> and I think a necessary one, to the smaller and the very many of them, uh, boards, committees, and commissions, two, three member committees, five member committees that you know only meet once a month or once every two months, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of those groups, uh, frankly, um, are so much better able to conduct their business. And if there is a requirement that they both uh, meet in person and offer public hybrid access, uh, I ask the legislature uh, to very seriously consider how is that going to be done um, other than I would suggest maybe by phone um, but it puts people at an inconvenience that, frankly, over the past year, they've gotten used to not having to suffer. And I'm going to give you one perfect, I think, a perfect example of the advantage of the virtual uh, form of meeting, which uh, it's not just a question of should you do it that way or should you not do it that way. It's a question of whether you would even get the work done if you couldn't do it virtually. And here's my example. We had these, um, this uh, expert panel number four that came together to help the school department and the school committee adjust to the public health requirements of getting, um, returning to uh, in-person education in the school buildings. And that expert panel number four drew on expertise like you wouldn't believe. I'm talking about people who then you can you could witness a, one of the virtual meetings of expert panel number four one day and then see two of the participants the next day quoted in the New York Times, you know, because they're that level of expert. And they were participating from Cambridge. They were participating from a hospital somewhere in downtown Boston. They were participating from all over to ask people of, of that caliber of expertise to be part of a panel which um, you know, is required to meet at least uh, the panel itself um, in person. And let's not forget this part, to require the town to figure out how to schedule those meetings conveniently when you need a room for every single one of those meetings. And let's not forget this part, <laughs> um, how to find the technology and to spread it around to all of those rooms so that they could do not only the in-person meeting from that room, but also invite public participation from that room. Um, and then I'll throw one more um, thing in here. Um, whatever, what about all of the, um, the uh, uh, additional benefits that were gained to do things such as to take a poll during the meeting? Uh, uh, those of us who participate in town meeting well know um, how we would conduct the votes well, the same technology that was used to conduct the votes at town meeting, which was very efficient, by the way, um, can be used to do a, a poll simultaneous with the meeting. You conduct the poll and get the results. On the Boylston Street Corridor Study Committee, uh, just about uh, 10 days ago, we had a meeting at which there were nearly 100 participants. And on the spur of the moment, one of the staff people behind the meeting said, uh, I, I think I'd like to take a poll right now and see how people heard about this meeting. And so, I don't know, some 60 people were polled on the spot and we got results on the spot as to how people heard about the meeting. So there's a lot of great things that we have gained. And the one thing that I've heard offered as a reason to, to require at some point in April, 2022, require boards, committees, and commissions to return to in-person meeting, at least for the members of the board. The one reason I've been offered is because uh, there are some members of the public, frankly, I don't know who they are, who couldn't attend um, unless they attended in person. They couldn't participate unless they participated in person. And I am not dismissive of the fact that not everybody has internet connection or knows how to master the technology. But as far as I know, everybody has access to a phone. 
Um, and uh, we're, we're well aware of how there have been virtual meetings conducted at which there were participants who participated by phone. Um, so I, I do hope the legislature takes a very, um, let's say a liberal view of the advantages that were gained uh, during our experience of uh, virtual meeting technology and that we preserve to the maximum uh, those advantages as much as possible in whatever emer emerges uh, in 2022. So Betsy, I know that you sort of stopped midway um, during Tommy's presentation. Do you wanna stop at this point for questions on that particular topic? Uh, sure, if there's anybody who has a question and we have a hand that was raised earlier that I um, didn't realize we missed. Donna, is, did, did you have a question you wanted? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, yeah actually, this was um, directed to Representative Matella. Thank you for your presentation. Um, now, um, you, launched, you launched your discussion of the um, upcoming fall town meeting platform. Can you be specific as to the unacceptability of a hybrid format? Sure. Um when we uh, passed emergency legislation 16-ish um, months ago, 15, 14 months ago, um, to allow for representative town meetings to do something other than meet fully in person, the legislation we passed specifically says all virtual. And the legislation that we passed and was signed into law uh, on June 16th refers specifically to that language and extends the timeline uh, from um, the end of the state of emergency to December 15th. And so the, the language is pretty clear um, in the view of me and everyone else I've talked to um, including folks at the Massachusetts Moderators Association, the other and less well-known MMA. Um, I haven't found anyone with, with technical expertise who has looked at that language and said that it allows hybrid. It, it, it just does not appear to. Thank you. And now Thanks. let's go back to the issues that John Van Skoyak raised, which had more to do with going forward and the matter of open town meeting and the ability to continue to provide what may turn out to be hybrid versions of public meetings um, such that there can be people who are um, able to come in person because that's important for them and people who are able to participate remotely and I have no idea um, where <laughs> the technical issues that would have to be addressed there would fall. But I assume it, in addition to um, solving, as, as Mr. Van Skoyak mentioned, the technical matter, like having the technology in place to permit those kinds of events, is there additional other sets of, of problems that would arise? And I'm, I'm, posing the question to Tommy, because the legislature is trying to deal with this. Sure. As, um, as Janice Kahn pointed out, the conference telephone meets the standard, and it is a piece of technology that most people have access to, a telephone, and not so difficult that even the Brookline Select Board can't implement. Um, in fact, frankly, I find it shocking to hear the select board say they can't figure out how to do a hybrid meeting until at least another month because nothing prevents them from allowing the public to call in on a telephone and to hear those words and to broadcast on Brookline Interactive Group. They could do that immediately and it would meet the standard immediately. Now, I'm not arguing that it's the best way to do it. We would obviously prefer for anyone who's testifying before the select board to have the ability to do visual because look, I'm an Italian, right? My hands are part of how I communicate. You don't see that on the telephone, right? But the fact of the matter is that telephone is sufficient. 
Um, and, and I will say that the reason why you don't see people on Zoom who aren't able to effectively use Zoom is because you're looking for them on Zoom. Of course, you don't see the people who aren't here, right? But we do know of, even in representative town meeting, uh, look, it's public record. Everybody would have heard Rita McNally and Gary Jones both called in because Zoom was not really available for them. And they had a horrible experience. And you can ask them, they will tell you, they felt like they were not included. They had a hard time communicating. Um, they weren't treated equally as the other representative town meeting members because they had to announce their votes publicly when the moderator remembered to poll them over the last year and a half. Sometimes their votes weren't even counted, right? So, um, you know, it's it's pretty clear that that some people are in-person people and they should be included too. Um, I think that's what the legislature is going to do. Um, it, my hope is that the legislature no longer requires a majority to attend in person. In my view, as long as one board or committee member shows up in person uh, and, the ch and the chair or whoever's running the meeting can be in person or virtual, then I think we, we really do get the best of both worlds. And, and from technology, we could start with telephone. We have that now. We know how to use it. Um, all rooms in town hall, uh, if they're not wired for, for telephone, you know, somebody should be immediately sacked. Um, and then we should roll out the additional IT and that may take more time. I do know that um, there's a lot of thought that the federal COVID um, resources that went out to cities and towns, in the case of Brookline, it was in excess of 30 million. Um, some of that money um, should be and is likely available for the kinds of IT infrastructure upgrades necessary. I also believe the state legislature should bond some money and make it available to cities and towns to help pay for this IT infrastructure. Uh, there's no question that a hybrid meeting gives us the best of all worlds, and that's what we ought to aspire Thank you, to. We, we need to move on. John, do you have some other comments you want to make? Well, on the uh, subject matter of the uh, redistricting uh, and, and the challenges that are posed by redistricting, um, I think people might be aware that the Mass Municipal Association raised strong objection to the legislation that is moving um, through, be, through, through the House and Senate. Uh, that, that would take into account the fact that the census data won't be available until the fall. Um, and as a consequence, um, give to the legislature priority to be the first to redistrict the, the uh, state representative, state legislative districts, and then the precinct redistricting would follow. And I think Tommy makes a very clear and a good case as to why that, that just might be the way we have to go. Um, on the other hand, I think people need to be aware of the downside to that. And uh, he expressed it uh, uh, in, insofar as he you know, brought up the example of how there might be the occasional uh, precinct where you would actually be showing up to vote on election day and some of the voters from precinct 13, which is my precinct, let's say, uh, would be voting for one state rep and some of the voters from precinct 13 would be voting for a different state rep. Um, yeah, that, that is a complication. And this is part of the reason that um, not just, uh, you know, local elected officials such as select members of the select board might be concerned, but town clerks are concerned. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, of, of um, concern expressed through the Mass Municipal Association by <coughs> clerks. And Secretary Galvin has expressed concerns about it. Um, and I think you have to, to, Tommy sort of said it's no more complicated than, for example, 12 and 13 both voting at the Runkle School, but it actually is because the voter has to arrive, who first has to be sorted as to whether you are 12 or 13, okay? And then if you're 13, you have to be sorted as to whether you're in Representative A's district or Representative B's district. And if you consider how those districts might be, uh, legislative districts I'm talking about, how they might be drawn, um, it could be pretty time consuming for the checkers at the table to have to verify, what did you say your address was? Okay, now we gotta figure out which of those two legislative districts we're talking about. Um, furthermore, the town clerk's office have to print up 
two different sets of ballots and they have to get that all squared away and, and make sure that those are available in proper order, you know, at the, um, um, at, in, in, in the precincts, uh, excuse me, in the uh, voting places. So there, there are downsides. I also want to point out that uh, people should be aware that the redistricting of Brookline for the town meeting uh, for, for, by precinct, and, and this impacts town meeting races, um, isn't necessarily going to be simple and uncomplicated. Um, there, there are some who would wish for a, um, a redistricting which actually preserves a lot of the precincts in place. And, and there's no reason why you can't do that if they do continue to meet the population requirements, which by the way, are that there be a maximum of 4,000 persons or per, per precinct um, and uh, that there be, excuse me, um, that the precincts have with, within 5% variation from other precincts uh, when it comes to the, the population of the precinct. Yeah. So if, for example, um, Brookline should turn out to be uh, have a population of 64,001, um, six, 16 times 4,000 is 64,000. You, you now are into the um, realm of, we might have to add a 17th um, precinct. And um, then you'd have to sort of redivide up the population among 17 precincts, uh, which would then shrink the number in each precinct. Um, I don't want to get further into those complications uh, because frankly, you know, my head spins. But I do want to say something about this, which I think gets lost. The, the real question on my mind, the primary question on my mind is why is it that currently precincts are more or less the same size in terms of the number of, of people and yet the voter turnout is so variable from precinct to precinct. There, there are quite literally um, precincts that have twice as many voters turn out um, as, as in other precincts. And there are precincts that have a much better rate of voter registration than in other precincts. So we can work the numbers all we want to as to where we put people and how we draw the lines. And as long as we meet the mathematical formulas for how many have to be in each precinct, but let's not lose sight of the fact of um, it's not, our job isn't done if we end up with um, 16 precincts, some of which vote with uh, twice the, the uh, frequency of, of other precincts. Um, and you. that's where I hope we'll put most of our efforts. Well, I'm sorry to stop you. And we have really, um, and we, we've run over what we should have allowed, but it's such an important set of issues to learn more about. I'm very happy that we have been able to hear from both Tommy Vitolo and John Van Skoyak. And I will say they've given us much to consider as we go forward. Um, and just a piece of additional information on redistricting. There will be a state public hearing on redistricting with regard to the fourth congressional district, which is the district that Brookline is part of. Um, on July 19th at noon, you have to uh, register for it uh, and you have to go to the um, Massachusetts legislature's website in order to get all the details. But <clears throat> there will be <coughs> at least <coughs> at that point, um, the joint legislative, um, the joint legislative <laughs> committee is holding a public hearing and there will be more to come. Uh, it's not over yet. And I really am regretful that we have to move on to our business meeting because we really do need to conduct, conduct that. So I thank you, Tommy. I thank you, John, both for your contributions. It's extraordinarily challenging to know all of these things are going on. And on the other hand, it's extremely reassuring to hear from two well-informed people to whom we can go back and say, okay, now what? <laughs> Which we probably will do. So thanks, Tommy. Thanks, John. And Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure. Be well. Yeah. Bye-bye.